You're extremely welcome to the Institute of International European Affairs. Delighted to see you. We know you've had a very hectic schedule, but met lots of key people and uh, we're really thrilled that you could find time to come to the Institute. Um, so uh, the Commissioner will speak to us for about 15 or 20 minutes on the subject of the Global Gateway Strategy. And then she has kindly agreed to take questions and comments, but she has a hard cut off at about uh, 3.45, has to go to the airport. So we, I hope we'll be able to cover a lot of interesting ground in, in, in that period. Um, the Commissioner, uh, let, me, let me first ask um, the Director General of Irish Aid to say a few words uh, uh, of introduction. The lecture series um, uh, of which your contribution is, is, is part is called the Development Matters series and is sponsored by Irish Aid. Um, the Institute works very closely with, um, with Irish Aid. So Michael, would you be good enough to say a few words? If you, thank you very much. Very much, David. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. I just was saying, David said Michael will say a few words, and then he proceeded to say my few words. So, because <laughs> I will keep it very short. This 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 lecture series that we work with the IIEA on is really important for us, and I think that's shown especially today with the uh, engagement participation of uh, Commis Commissioner Erpelainen. We have worked together with the Commissioner and her her colleagues for quite a while to make this visit happen. And we are really, really pleased that she's been able to come today. It's been a very hectic schedule for her, although I suspect that all the commissioner's schedules are hectic uh, like this. Um, I would just say uh, Ireland's commitment to the European Union is without doubt. We don't, we don't, without question. Uh, but as, as I've said before here, the reason that we have as Ireland an official development assistance or efficient international development program is because we joined the European Economic Community back in 1973, along with Denmark and another country, the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, but it is that was the origins of our international development program, and, and I hope the uh, commissioner can see that from her discussions today with the Tornstra and with Minister Fleming, that our international development program is no longer what is a simple aid program. It's a central element of Ireland's foreign policy. And it is also a central issue for our engagement with Europe. We are now uh, net contributors to the budget. And it is really important to us that um, our contribution to the European uh, Development Cooperation budget is one that helps, uh, that gives us some influence and helps us to focus especially on uh, poverty, uh, food insecurity, and the furthest behind first. So we are really, really uh, uh, delighted to have the commissioner here today, and especially to have her focus on Global Gateway. It's <clears throat> a complex and crisis-ridden world, and Europe's offer to the developing world is one which has to change to meet circumstances. And uh, I know that uh, many of you and many here have questions uh, to ask about the development of, of, of Global Gateway and nobody better than Commissioner Erpelainen, who's been in this uh, international partnerships job since uh, 2019 to uh, address those issues and answer those questions. So I just want to say, Commissioner, you're incredibly welcome to Ireland. We're sorry our Aer Lingus pilots have made your stay a little shorter than otherwise, but we're very glad that other pilots ensured you got here. Thank you. Um, so very briefly, the, the Commissioner uh, served as a member of the Finnish Parliament from 2003 to 19, and in 2008 you became the first woman leader in the Social Democratic Party of Finland uh, from 2000 and, um, it, anyway, for a couple of years you served as the Deputy Prime Minister, as we know, and as the Finance Minister. And during that time, you uh, became closely involved with development issues, which we were delighted to see. And that meant that when you were nominated as, as Finance Commissioner, that you were extremely well qualified to move into, to, to develop that interest and to represent EU the EU's interest in that. A couple of house, housekeeping points. Um, the uh, for those of you in the room, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question or a comment, uh, and we will come to you with a roving mic. For those of you who are listening uh, online, um, please indicate by using the the uh, the Q and A um, function, and uh, you'll see that on your screens. 
Please feel free uh, to anybody to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA and at the hashtag Development Matters. And we're also live streaming the, the uh, event today. So a very warm welcome to those who are joining us via YouTube. With that, Commissioner, over to you. We're looking forward very much to what you have to say. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Indeed, this is a visit which we have been preparing for some time. So I have to say that I'm very pleased, uh, first of all, to be in Ireland, to be in Dublin, but also I'm very pleased to address the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. I think here at the Institute, you really provide a forum for debate, discussion, and innovation. And of course, through your studies, you also provide and propose policy solutions to the world's most pressing challenges. And unfortunately, today, as we all know, the world faces not only one or even two, but multiple crises. I think we are experiencing a level of tension and polarity not seen, uh, seen since the end of the Cold War. And in this polar, polar crisis context, how can we achieve a more, a more sustainable future? I think this is at least a question I'm asking myself. And um, I have to say that the EU's, the European Union's answer to this question is our 300 billion euro global gateway strategy, which I will introduce to you shortly. But first, let me take a closer look at the context behind it, the new paradigm in international relations. I'm a former teacher also, so I thought that maybe it's always good to describe the context and then go to the uh, very concrete initiatives and, and strategies. So as they say, Reality can sometimes be stranger than fiction. And when I took up my role as commissioner for international partnerships in the European Commission five years ago, to be very honest, I never thought I would see war return to European soil. I say this also coming from Finland. Yet today, Russia's brutal attack on Ukraine continues. Meanwhile, the war in Gaza is unfortunately escalating. The Taliban have returned to power in Afghanistan and military coups have multiplied in Africa. Then there was the pandemic, COVID-19, not only claimed lives, but also destroyed economies. And it continues to take an economic toll. Because today, more than half, more than half of low income countries are in debt distress or at high risk of it. Climate change has also accelerated, wreaking havoc around the world. It continues to hit the poorest countries the hardest, those least responsible for it, and also, unfortunately, least equipped to respond. As you know, th these crises are not isolated. Instead, they occur against a backdrop of long-term challenges 
and trends. If we look at the global uh, demographics, global demographics continue to shift. In 1890, Europe was 25% of the world population. Today, it is less than 10%. New manufacturing and economic centers have emerged. Digitalization is progressing at high speed, but so are the divides it create, creates. Those of us old enough to remember the Cold War can recall that geographic, uh, geopolitically, it was simpler time. An icon curtain divided Europe and two superpowers competed for global dominance. By contrast, today we are living in a more complex, I would say complex world. The new multipolar relations paradigm, uh, sorry, the new international relations paradigm is multipolar. New global powers are emerging or re-emerging. And today's world is both hyper-competitive and hyper-connected with deeply integrated links tr in trade, but also in financial markets. A world where supply chains can easily disrupt it, can easily be uh, disrupted or weaponized even weaponized, which we see, for instance, in Ukraine, but also some other part of the world. A world where Russia and others seek to extend their influence, push alternative governance models and undermine Europe. This is their main aim, to break the hegemony of the West, including Europe and the US. So in the new international relations paradigm, geopolitics and geoeconomics have become intertwined. And countries around the world must respond. And this actually brings me to my second point. Europe's answer to this paradigm shift is our global gateway strategy which seeks to boost resilience for the EU and partner countries alike. Launched by, to the, launched by President von der Leyen in 2021, Global Gateway supports smart, clean, and secure links in the digital energy and transport sector. And it helps strengthen health, education, and research systems across the world. So we want to accelerate green and digital transitions in our partner countries. To increase impact, we deploy a collective approach called Team Europe. It not only brings together the resources and expertise of the EU institutions, but also its 27 member states, including Ireland, their development finance institutions, the European Investment Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It also seeks to mobilize the private sector. We also leverage EU funds to take some of the risk out of investment through a mixture of grants, concessional loans, and guarantees we attract private sector investments to the countries that need it most. Now, as with any large transformational strategy, it begs the question, what does Global Gateway mean in practice? At its core, Global Gateway is about high quality partnership. So we seek to understand our international partners' goals, 
for the future and how EU values intersect with them. We seek to create links, not dependencies, and to really offer truly comprehensive partnership, not just hard infrastructure, but also the regulatory support, technology transfer, and local job creation to make investments last. For example, a little bit over two years ago at 2022 EU-AU summit, African leaders emphasized the need for strategic autonomy in vaccine and pharmaceutical production, not just to cope with COVID-19, but also malaria and other infectious diseases. Currently, Africa imports over 99% of its vaccines and 94% of its medicines. So Africa is completely dependent on import in terms of vaccines and medicines. So through a 1 billion euro global gateway initiative, European and African partners, including innovation champion BioNTech, are bringing new technologies to the continent. Critical mRNA vaccines have already been produced in South Africa, uh, and state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities are taking shape in Rwanda, and with Ghana and Senegal poised to follow. Our efforts focus on cultivating the right environment for the both uh, the production and uptake of health products and innovations. This spans everything from partnering with universities on skill development. We have to educate a lot of new web workforce, nurses, laboratory uh, workers, but also doctors, researchers, uh, but in addition to that, we are also working with African regulators on timely market authorization of new products. As African vaccine and medicine manufacturing picks up pace, we will work to strengthen broader health systems and access to care, ensuring better health and well being for all. So, this vaccine production, medicine production initiative, it's very much linked to our aim and objective to support strength, uh, healthcare, basic healthcare systems and primary healthcare systems in, in Africa. Another example of global gateway in action, Namibia. Namibia has world-class solar and wind resources and holds 30% of the minerals necessary for the green transition. It has embarked on a path for green industrialization and aims to become a global front runner in renewable energy. This is the political objective. Meanwhile, the EU seeks to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. That's the uh, political commitment made by the Ursula von der Leyen's commission, but very much supported by our member states. And Europe needs alternative energy resources to support the green transition in Europe. Last year, the EU and Namibia signed a partnership agreement that aims to decarbonize economies and create jobs in both our regions. Today, it's taking shape in a 1 billion euro partnership investments. At the first EU Namibia Business Forum last year, we brought together government and finance stakeholders to help create partnerships to expand green hydrogen production, develop new products, and support a Namibia based industry for raw materials. We are also collaborating to meet environmental, social, and governance standards. And we are offering training and skill development so that all Namibians can benefit from the job opportunities created by green industrialization. So our aim is really to create local and national value. 
we don't know, only want to extract minerals and you know export them to Europe. We also want to support Namibia to industrialize it, its society, really to create also local and national value. And this is highly appreciated uh, by our Namibian uh, counterparts and, and partners. The EU is already partnering with the African Union to promote regional economic integration. We know that from our own experience from Europe. From the beginning, the European Union was about economic integration. So the African continental freight, free trade area opens access to the largest free trade area in the world. And in the past seven years, we have allocated more than 400 million euros to help it take shape. In terms of diary, for instance, we want to foster public-private sector partnerships with EU companies who have the expertise to help develop the sector in Nigeria while having the capacity to provide support and offtake to local producers. And this would not only benefit Nigeria, but the entire continent. It would reduce Africa's dependency on imports, create jobs, promote nutrition and food security, and increase Africa's share of the global economy. As I said, this partnership is still in the early stages, so stay tuned also in Ireland, where you have a lot of expertise on nutrition, of course, uh, on agriculture in, in general. But I hope that actually these couple of examples give a sense of depth and breadth of global gateway partnerships and what makes them unique. So global gateway is not only investing in our hard infrastructure, it's much more. It's really a transformative change which we try to provide through these investments, but also this, through this partnership, focusing on technical assistance, capacity building, training, skills, education, and so forth. Dear friends, earlier I referred to the um, holy crisis confronting the world. The dictionary defines holy crisis as the simultaneous occurrence of several catastrophic events. And I have to say that even on paper, it's frightening. The reality is far worse. In such times, it can be easy to throw up our hands to think, what can we do? But based on my experience, I have to say that I'm even con more convinced now than I was when I started as a commissioner that we can do a lot and we must do a lot. More than halfway to 2030, the world is on track to deliver around 15% of the sustainable development goals, only 15%. So we need to adopt a new approach. And this is, dear friend, this is the idea behind the Global Gateway. Ireland is already partnering with the EU on 26 Team Europe initiatives. So together we are having an impact in countries across the globe. Of course, one of the reasons why I am here in Ireland today, uh, I look forward to deepening our partnership with Ireland when it comes, when it, when it takes up to, to the presidency of the Council of the EU in 2026. Then you are the one who is really in the driving seat. So through collaboration, we can pave the way for a successful UN summit of the future. I think it's, it's bit our obligation and duty as Europeans also to pave the way to restore faith in multilateralism. We believe in international rule-based order. And 
I think that we can really uphold the values we hold most dear. As some of the foremost thought leaders and development experts, I believe that also you here in Ireland, you can and hopefully you will help lead the way. So thank you very much uh, and very much looking forward to our conversation. Thanks very much, Commissioner. Fascinating uh, overview of, of um, what the gateway strategy is about, but also the wider international context. I, I took particular comfort from a number of things you said about uh, about the, the the thrust of the strategy, the idea that it's not purely about infrastructure, that that it is it goes much further. And so I take it, therefore, that it is aligned very fully with the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. Uh, so, so um, that 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 was uh, encouraging to hear. I'd like to open the floor now for questions, comments, um, obviously for anyone in the audience and also people online. Thank you. <laughs> Simon Marshall, my name. I work for Locus, um, which is the alliance of NGOs, international NGOs. Uh, I think you put in that some of our members earlier, so I won't try to get too much detail. But um, I think that, as you know, you're in a country here, beyond civil society, but a country right across this area that cares deeply about what we call the people who are furthest behind. Um, the, uh, we have taken that SDG value very much to part here. So, uh, in the context of global head, there's also the the cuts that we expect to come to uh, the development instrument. How can we make sure that what we've called the differentiated approach is followed, that, that protects people, particularly in, in um, context of conflict or fragile conflicts? Is that something that we care very deeply about here? Um, that's, that's the first question, if I may. Um, and then the second part would be in the emphasis in the global gateway on. Uh, the private sector on, on services and infrastructure. And um, how can we also protect uh, the public sphere, what we might refer to as the commons? Uh, and when we talk about healthcare services and the climate change uh, uh, technologies, uh, we would be interested in your views on technology transfer, and for example, that might be able to protect public ownership of those public goods. That way, and um, thinking of you as someone with a, a background as a social democrat in, in that side of the fence, as well as the private sphere, and um, we'd be very interested in, in those areas in the context of the SDGs, how we're going to achieve that, and um, how we're going to bridge the gaps that you're afraid. Thanks, Simon. We might take a couple of others and then give the commissioner a chance to respond. Yes, please. I, uh, I was wondering, uh, back in uh, 1975, which incidentally you said two years after Ireland joined and the EU, you see, the global convention uh, was signed between the ACP and the European Union. Now, I was wondering uh, if there is a connection uh, uh, with the gateway uh, program as it, uh, as it is now. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. It was uh, very, very interesting indeed. Um, I have a question just about uh, the Global Gateway and EU external action. Uh, you've mentioned that it is a crucial uh, instrument now of uh, EU external action. Um, but with democracy in decline around the world and indeed in the EU um, and possibly affecting the EU's clout internationally, I wondered, do you feel that this, in fact, is a challenge to the foreign policy rationale underpinning the Global Gateway? Thank you. Okay, Commissioner, would you like to tackle those? Yes, thank you very much for your questions. And 
what I what I actually tried to describe in my speech was this um, this paradigm shift or paradigm change. Um, to be very honest, our partners in the global south, they don't want to be subject of aid. They, they want to be actors themselves. They want to stand by their own feet. They want to choose with whom they are partnering with. And um, they didn't like this kind of donor recipient relationship where the Europeans come and they impose and they tell what they, what we expect the recipients of our aid to do. And that's why I, as a commissioner, but also the EU, we wanted to change the paradigm. We wanted to create equally, equal mutually beneficial partnerships where, of course, we want to support our partners in their sustainable development because this is the policy framework which we are committed to as an international community. So we are committed to Agenda 2030, Sustainable Development Goals. But in order to succeed in that, we understood also that we need to engage much more with private sector. Because with only public resources, we cannot achieve sustainable development goal, I, goals. I say this also as a former finance minister myself. This is a reality. The demands and needs are so enormous. Only in Africa, three times more inhabitants, citizens than we have in Europe. In Africa, 1.3 billion citizens, 70% of them are below 35 years old. If we look at the forecast for the future, by 2050, in Africa, there will be six times more citizens than we have in European Union. 2.5 billion citizens. And most of them are still children and teenagers and young people. So still half of the citizens in Africa don't have access to electricity. They don't, many of them, they don't have access to education or if they have access to education, the quality of education is so poor that I was in Mozambique 10 days ago where half of the pupils in primary school are graduating from the primary school, only half of the pupils because of the quality. So taking into account all these challenges and the volume and, 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 and the size of these challenges, we have to be able to mobilize more resources for Agenda 2030. And that's why the one new element of our paradigm shift is that we have to work more closely, be more united as Europeans. So we have to work as a one team, member states, our development agencies, our European Commission, but also we have to attract and encourage our companies to invest in our partner countries. Because only with public resources, we cannot accelerate uh, green and digital transitions, which are very much needed in, in, in Africa in order to enable people to access ele uh, electricity, for instance. So when it comes to fragile context and fragile countries, of course, we understand that when it comes to Afghanistan or when it comes to many Sahelian countries in West Africa, global gateway is not the right tool for these countries in these circumstances. And that's why we use a different tools in order to support the citizens of those societies and countries uh, uh, in their needs. For instance, in Afghanistan, we have provided almost every year uh, around 200 million euros uh, financial support to the citizens of Afghanistan. Although we don't recognize Taliban's, we don't engage with Taliban's, but we are providing support to the population 
via UN agencies, WHO, we work with the uh, uh, World Food Programme, we work with UNICEF in order to provide uh, access to healthcare and, and education services, also very much food security, in a close cooperation with our humanitarian uh, partners, so DG ECHO in, in the Commission and, and, and of course also different humanitarian actors on the ground. It's very much the same in Sahel. We saw military coups in Niger, in Burkina Faso, in Mali recently. We don't work with those military authorities, but we still keep our promises to the population, to the citizens. So we work through the civil society organizations, through NGOs, also through UN agencies, in order to, pro to provide support in health, in education, in food security. So this is part of our commitment to the citizens to leave no one behind. Maybe in the future, of course, it depends how things are developing in those countries. There are also opportunities for Global Gateway. We know that there are still a couple of projects in West Africa, which we started before the coup took place. And we try to continue those projects. But uh, I think it's important to recall that Global Gateway is not the only approach the European Union is, is uh, offering to our, our partners. But most of our partners are very interested in Global Gateway because they see that this is very much beneficial also from their point of view. So they are very, I would say, uh, interested in, and, and there is a lot of buying in our partners. Uh, technology uh, transfer, we are supporting, for instance, uh, technology uh, transfer hub under the WHO in South Africa, very much funding that. And I mean, I think this whole aim of Global Gateway, not to create new depends, then new dependencies, because we want our partners to be more self-reliant, more independent. We don't want them to be dependent on us. We don't, we want them to, to be more autonomous. So the whole idea is, of course, through this Maxim production, uh, medicine production uh, initiatives, really to, you know, to bring them technology, to support them to, to start to produce their own medicine and vaccines. Of, of course, with the help of our companies and our technology. Um, Samoa Agreement, that's the so-called post-Cotonou Agreement, which we signed uh, finally last November in Samoa in the Pacific. I was the chief negotiator for that. So that's, you know, there first we have Lome, then we have Cotonou, and now we have Samoa. So that's the new uh, agreement we signed with the OECP as countries, so with 79 countries. And uh, actually, uh, this is a new policy framework for our cooperation with Africa, with the Pacific and the Caribbean countries. We launched our uh, regional protocol for Caribbean one little bit over one month ago when I was in, in Antigua and Barbuda uh, in, in the Caribbean. We will launch our Pacific protocol in August in Dogo, where I'm traveling to. And in the autumn, we plan to uh, launch our regional protocol under the Samoa Agreement with African partners. So this is, I would say, this is like the policy framework where we define our values, you know, different uh, principles of our cooperation uh, with the OECP uh, as countries. Then the last point, I think, um, if, if you allow me to share my, my, my concern with you here in Dublin today, um, I think if we look at Africa, Europe is still the biggest ODA provider. We are still the biggest trading partner. We are still the biggest investor in Africa. But 
If you ask citizens in Africa, in several African countries, and we have done also a certain surveys, people, this normally ordinary citizens, they don't recognize that. And I think uh, we have to be more visible. We have to be more tangible in our projects so that also the citizens, uh, they see that what is the value, what is what is the benefit, you know, of, of, of our partnership from their point of view. But if I look at the discourse and debate currently in Europe, I don't know if that's the case in Ireland, but that's definitely the case in my own country, Finland, but I would say in general, many European member states, it's very much focused on defense and security. And I understand that. I never thought that I would see a war in our continent in my lifetime again. Unfortunately, there is one. And it means that we have to focus more on our own defense, our common defense, our military capabilities, defense industry, and so forth. But what is important, and this is a bit my concern, is that while we are investing in our own security, we cannot turn our back to the rest of the world. So Russia is a threat, a security threat for Europe at the moment, but there are also other security threats we are facing, like climate change, terrorism, migration, pandemics, and all these security threats actually require international cooperation in order to address them, address them. We cannot fight climate change only, you know, focusing on Europe. We have to engage partnerships. Uh, we have to engage with other partners and, and create partnerships in order to succeed. So that's why we have to have a balanced approach. We have to invest in our own security within Europe but at the same time, we have to also invest in our development cooperation. We have to increase our ODA. We have to invest in our external relations and international partnerships in order to address also, you know, the broader uh, spectrum of, of security challenges. Um, otherwise, if we do so that we cut our ODA, if we cut our international cooperation budgets, if we withdraw our presence, you know, close down embassies, which some of the member states are doing uh, from the world, we might end up in the future, let's say in five to 10 years, where Europe is in terms of defense, much more secured, but in terms of geopolitics, much more weaker and isolated. And I don't think that that kind of scenario actually would be beneficial for Europeans and for Europe. So that's why I think that, and, and that's why I'm so strong advocate also for the global gateway that we have to offer, we, have, we need to have a positive offer for our international partnerships and we need to invest in that. If we turn inwards, uh, I don't think that uh, the future of Europe will be very positive. Thanks very much, Commissioner. Um, let me first pay a compliment to Finland. In um, uh, case, case anyone doesn't know, it, Finland is leading the world at the moment in terms of uh, implementation of the SDGs according to the latest rankings, and uh, that's extremely impressive. So that shows that in Finland, at least, they are still looking to the outside world and looking to the, 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 all the challenges facing humanity and not merely to those of security and defence. Uh, I just have one quick question of my own, and then I want to bring in a question uh, from Michael Doyle online. My own question is just, how are you finding the current investment climate? Are, are the private investors whom you want to uh, bring in as partners, are they actually responding to the invitation represented by the Global Gateway? Or is there a, a slightly more cautious 
um, atmosphere because of the fact that, frankly, uh, multinational solutions are, are not uh, experiencing their finest hour at the moment. We have a lot of division, con conflict is distracting attention. I'm just wondering, what's the overall business response to uh, to the, um, the the invitation represented by the Gateway? The question from Michael Joy then is, uh, in taking forward the Global Gateway Programme, what lessons, if any, has the EU drawn from China's experience with, with its earlier Belt and Road Initiative? Well, uh, regarding the first question, uh, I think there is a lot of appetite, a lot of interests among, you know, business community in Europe. Uh, I have visited almost all the member states. Always when I travel, I have this kind of a principle that I meet civil so civil society representatives, I meet youth and young people, but I also meet uh, business sector representatives because I want to understand also in our partner countries that how do they assess you know the business environment what are the you know the biggest obstacles uh, in order to attract investments in in those countries so I would say that my general feeling is that um, this initiative is very much welcomed by European companies and business community for some countries, including I learned uh, for Ireland, this is a new way of working that you traditionally have not, you know, combined your ODA and trade and, and, and business links. And I respect that and I, I fully understand also the background of it. I have to say that me, as a politician, to explain my background, I have also, you know, not change my mind, but I think I have seen new opportunities, how we can actually use ODA for the enabling, you know, to support and develop the enabling environment. So I my 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 very strong political commitment for the ODA is really to use that for education, which it's my personal priority. I increased our funding to education from 7% to 13%. So when I started as commissioner, 7%, only 7% of our funding went to education. Now it's 13%, so I almost doubled that. I think OGA is very much needed for health basic services, social protection, you know, capacity building, technical assistance, these, these kind of, uh, uh, issues. But then, I mean, with ODA money, we cannot really do a lot in terms of, you know, hard infrastructure investments. Of course, we can use our budget as an incentive for companies. You know, we can give, for instance, guarantees uh, for the National Development uh, Agency or, or institutions so that they can uh, work with companies, provide loans, but it's very limited. Uh, and that's why I think we need to get also these, you know, mm -hmm. private companies on board. We need to attract European companies to invest in energy sector, in transport, in digital, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in those countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very delighted to learn that uh, Ireland is now preparing its Africa strategy. Uh, so I think that would maybe pave a way for the discussions and conversations also between different stakeholders in Ireland, academics, civil society organizations, but also business community. Because I think you have also a lot to offer. You have a lot of expertise in terms of renewable energy, you know, in terms of digital, in terms of education. But how to work as a team, first in Ireland, and then to be part of the team Europe at the European level to also scale up, you know, these different innovations and investments. I think this is very much what the Global Gateway is about. What is the difference comparing to Chinese Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, there are a lot of different kind of offers, different global players and actors are offering for our partners. How I 
see the European offer. It's 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 positive offer, which does not want to create dependencies. Unfortunately, we know that through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, China has enabled many of our partner countries to invest in hard infrastructure, in ports, in railways, in stadiums, and so forth. But what is the outcome of that partnership? Very, very high debt levels. So that we have countries in Africa whose, which, uh, which, uh, which face the reality that 70% or 16%, 60 or 70% of their revenues actually go to, goes to debt servicing. So there is a huge dependency on China because of these investments. And what is the aim of the Global Gateway is not to create dependency, one, or, but really support the independency and self-reliance of those countries. So as I said, we bring European companies we invest in enabling environment, but we always want to create also local and national value. So we want to support our partners to industrialize their own societies, boost the economic growth, create more opportunities for young people, shop, create jobs and so forth. So, of course, we also respect high quality standards when it comes to human rights, when it comes to social standards and environmental standards. So sometimes I'm accused that Europe have too many Europe has too many conditions and principles, but I always tend to say that the European Union is only operating its with its taxpayers' money. That's the money we have. We, we get it from our taxpayers. And because of that, we have to stick our values. We have to stick also to the principles of the European Union. So human rights, rule of law, democracy. Because we have to be accountable and we have to be able to explain to our citizens how their money is used and what is the outcome of uh, the different cooperation and partnerships so that citizens here in Ireland, but in the rest of the Europe, they know that, okay, the money is used for good purposes, also based on, on our values. values. Yeah. That's an excellent note on which to end, Commissioner. Thank you very, very much for a fantastic uh, um, presentation of the strategy and the generosity with which you answered the questions and a lot more we could have covered, but your time is short. We really appreciate you coming to us. Hope to see you again in whatever capacity in future, and we wish you well with the uh, implementation of the strategy. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.